When I was younger, uh, my favorite basketball team, at least for a while, was the Chicago Bulls. Um, I know there are many who were like me, and they were my favorite team because they had, at least for a time, my favorite player, Michael Jordan. Now, those who are interested in basketball, either in the kind of casual way or those who take it very seriously, my, from my vantage point, my opinion is that the consensus of those who are marginally interested in basketball and those who are like professional commentators, that the consensus is that Michael Jordan was the greatest basketball player of all time. Not everybody thinks that, but I think the consensus is that, at least that's my opinion. But one of the things that can often be forgotten is that he didn't get to where he was, namely six championships, so showing up in six finals and not losing any. He didn't get there on his own. Some of you might remember back in the uh, 1993 finals, in game six, the Bulls were down by two points, and John Paxson, some of you may be like, I don't know who John Paxson is. Exactly. But for those of you who know basketball, you know, yeah, you know who John Paxson is. He hit a three-pointer that essentially was the game winner. There might have been like three-point-something seconds left, and then the Bulls took a 99-98 to point lead. Some of you might remember in 1997, something similar. To close out the series against the Utah Jazz, it was a game winner by Steve Kerr. And you can go through other examples of great players who played along Michael Jordan during the dynasty years, but the point is this. At the end of the day, as great as he was in basketball, he wasn't a solo act. There were men who helped him secure that title, as it were, of greatest basketball player of all time. And what we're seeing as we go through the account that's before us, and what we're going to see is that it's a reminder to us that David wasn't a solo act. That he rose to prominence and king of, as king of Israel, not because he was in and of himself simply extraordinary enough to do so. But God had put around him mighty warriors that were used by God to, quote, Make him king according to the word of Yahweh concerning Israel. 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 10. David's life wasn't preserved and his kingship wasn't secured on his own. There were many noble warriors who fought alongside of him. It's a good reminder as an aside that the advancing of the kingdom of God, though it looked much different in the Old Testament context than it does now, but the advancement of the kingdom of God has always been a team sport. God uses people to advance his kingdom, not simply solo acts. And Lord willing, when we get to it next week, you might already be seeing it, there are many parallels that can be drawn within a local church context. That advancing the kingdom is not a solo act kind of thing. It's a team sport in the body of Christ as well. But we'll get there, Lord willing, next week. So today we come to the fifth episode in the epilogue of 2 Samuel. Now, we won't rehearse all the dynamics of this, but just for your consideration, remember that in 2 Samuel 21, so begins the epilogue. The inspired narrator has chosen, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, six episodes, essentially, to kind of sum up the kingdom as it was established under David. Here is episode number five. Now, here, this episode concerns David's mighty men. It's not Hebrews 11, uh, but it does have a hall of faith kind of feel to it. It's remarkably similar to 1 Chronicles 11, where the list that's here through verse 39 is extended. Now, at this point, some people may be thinking something along these lines. I can't really imagine a list giving me any bit of exhilaration or edification on this Sunday morning. Right? I think many a Bible reader, when they come to different lists in the Scriptures, they don't think, okay, here comes exhilaration. I mean, I've been pastoring for quite a while, and I can't recall a time, not that it hasn't happened, I can't recall a time when somebody has come to me and said, you know what, I was reading about the signers of the covenant in Nehemiah. I was reading through the genealogy in First Chronicles, and I just stopped, and I broke out in worship. Now, should that happen? Well, I definitely think it could happen. When you go through the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and you see some of the people who are listed in that genealogy, it is a reminder that God is gracious and He works through fallen people. When you go into Romans 16, it's just the end of the epistle, right? Paul is just greeting the church of Rome and he's naming some names. But you might become very well inspired when you see how these people who are not known in the annals of history outside of Romans 16 were mightily used by God in the kingdom of God. So I would hope and I want to encourage you to lay aside any weights of presuppositions that you have concerning lists that might undercut the expectation of edification. 
Yes, this is a list before us when we get into the totality of it through verse 39, but you're also going to see that there's little narratives that are strewn into the text. And oh, I think there is so much for us to learn. We begin in 2 Samuel 23, verses 8 through 12, where we read, These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Josheb, Bashabeth, the Tachmanite chief among the captains. He was called the Dino the Esnite because he had killed 800 men at one time. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahoite, one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel had retreated. He arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. The Lord, or Yahweh, brought about a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to plunder. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Hararite. The Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. So the people fled from the Philistines, but he stationed himself in the middle of the field, defended it, and killed the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. Now, some of us familiar with um, both um, cartoons and superheroes of times past, you might recall that there were often numeric associations with different superheroes, the dynamic duo. Some of you might remember that old cartoon, the Galaxy Trio. It was the Fantastic Four. Well, here you have essentially the three. You are introduced to the three right here. They are, the, the list is introduced this way. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. But here at the beginning, we're told of three individuals, and there are three brief episodes concerning them. Now, the first was Josheb Bashabeth the Tachmanite. You probably re prefer referring to him by the other name there, Adino the Esnite. But without going into extended detail, there appears to be some copyist issues with this. I think the better rendering, or better name, is the one that we find in 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 11, namely Jashobim. And those of you who are interested in this kind of thing know that the debate concerning his name or the multitude of names that this man has does not stop there. But with that being said, uh, he was chief among the captains. So he was known, he was held in high esteem, he was honored, and you say, well, why was he known and held in high esteem and honored? Because he did something that was rather unique. According to the text, he had killed 800 men at one time. So it's no surprise that this man would be chief among the three. He did something that was rather remarkable. Now remember, in this Old Covenant context, by the way, right, God who could use anything to judge nations, right? He could use earthquakes. He could use famines. He could use just, he could have people just suddenly, you know, die. He could use an angel like we see with the Assyrians. He could use many things in this Old Testament context. He used Israel so often to be an instrument by which he would judge enemy nations, but then he would also use nations to judge Israel. It's part of what God did in this superintending of history as clearly seen in the Old Testament, well, here, this man is a man that seems to have the odds overwhelmingly stacked against him. Now, we don't know all the details of the battle scene, but when you look at the two episodes that follow and you kind of see a common thread here, it is likely that he's on the battlefield and he has the odds stacked against him. Was it 800 to 1? Maybe. Was it something close to 800 to 1? Maybe. When you look in the Chronicles account, maybe the dynamics are a little bit different. Maybe it was 300 to 1. But whatever the numbers were exactly, the odds were against him, stacked up against him. And yet he was used by God in battle in this amazing way. Again, this is something we see in Old Testament contexts. Remember, it might be kind of weird to our modern ears, but remember that in Judges chapter 3, for instance, there was a guy by the name of Sham, uh, Shamgar who was used by God with an ox goad to kill 600 Philistines. And that was a really big deal because the Philistines were bad and he was used by God to deliver Israel. You might remember that Samson, for instance, was empowered by God, by the Spirit of God, for the purpose of beginning to deliver the children of Israel from the Philistines. They were under Philistine oppression, and the Holy Spirit came upon Samson, and that was the beginning of their deliverance, Judges 13, verse 5. For instance, amazing story in the scriptures, right? That Samson killed 1,000 Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. You might say, like, how in the world did that happen? A couple notes about that. The text tells us that it was a fresh jawbone, so that means that likely the tooth was still intact, by the way. So it would make for quite a weapon. Donkeys are kind of big. Jaws are kind of big. And you got a tooth at the end. It would be quite a weapon. Not to mention the fact that when you look at the details of the battle, 
Samson had the higher ground. Philistines were going uphill, probably tired in the battle. Holy Spirit was upon Samson. That's the biggest variable in the equation. There were all of these dynamics. And I want to make a quick aside, because we see this kind of thing happening in the scriptures. My opinion, my opinion is that when you look in history, that one of the reasons why God in his providence has things like Leonidas and the Spartans. Remember there were 300 Spartans alongside of some other warriors for a time that fought the Persian army of Xerxes, and they had killed 10,000 Persian soldiers. But then when the Persian soldiers had broken ranks, then all of a sudden other soldiers from uh, Leonidas' army, not the Spartans, others were dismissed, but they continued to fight, and about another 10,000 were killed. And th that's pretty astounding. And part of the reason why I think that God has allowed that kind of thing to be recorded is so that the skeptic who looks at accounts like this and says, how could that happen? It's as though through those secular historical accounts, God takes one leg out of the, school, the, the stool of the skeptic so that the skeptic might not sit in a place that is dangerous. But God advanced his kingdom in this way in many ways, even when the odds were stacked against his people. So many examples, right? You think of Gideon's 3,000, right? No. Gideon's what? 300. Whittled down from 32,000 to battle 120,000 Midianites. Odds overwhelmingly stacked against Gideon and the people of Israel. What about a New Testament kind of example? What about 5,000 plus people that needed to be fed at one time? And we're talking big emphasis on the plus there. 5,000 plus. And what did they have to use? One little boy's lunch. <laughs> and look what God did. He could take little and he could use it for much, even though the odds were overwhelmingly stacked against him in that context. And I think this is a great reminder that statistical analysis has its place, but in the kingdom of God, it doesn't have the final say. Note that. Apart from specific textual promises in the word of God, I cannot guarantee you of any outcome. Specific promises in the word of God, I can guarantee you of that. But apart from that, I cannot guarantee you of any outcome. But I can also tell you that it's a good reminder to us that odds stacked up against you are not a guarantee of an outcome in a situation either. I've told some of you on Wednesday night a couple weeks ago about a pastor whose testimony I had recently heard. Um, last year when I was sick with COVID and the blood clots that came with that, uh, he was sick as well. And uh, the first six days of being sick, it was likely the Delta strain that he had. First six, six days, he kind of felt okay. He felt fine. But then all of a sudden, uh, after that, it started going downhill. It went downhill really fast to the point where he was in the hospital and lost the overwhelming majority of his lung function. Uh, they had told his wife that he had a 5% chance of survival. They had told him while he was in the hospital that he had a 0% chance of survival. From his recounting of the story, they offered to euthanize him because with his lung function being where it was essentially that they would help him to kind of die in peace because dying that way, perpetual suffocation would be a horrible way to go and that they could give him something and then his heart rate would slow and so on and so on. But he didn't take that. Young man too, was, was an older man, has a young wife and then young children as well. But they told him that he had a 0% chance of survival while he was in the hospital. And there was back and forth, I won't go through all the details of the story, in and out of the hospital, back into the ICU. But it came to a point when he was in the ICU, and then the smoke had cleared, as it were, and it looked like he was going to make it through, and they were going to check him out. And the nurse who came to get him cleaned up to, check that, to be checked out of the ICU, after she had cleaned him up, she sat down next to him. And she said that she had been working in the ICU for a long time, and she had taken care of a lot of people, and she had never seen anyone as sick as him walk out alive. She said that she didn't know what to do with that. One statistical anomaly overcome by the grace of God, by the grace of God. But then there was yet another one. Usually people who are in his circumstances, per his accounting of the story, would need a lung transplant because of how damaged his lungs were and how little the function was. We need a lung transplant within two months of being released from the hospital. And when he went to see the pulmonologist, the pulmonologist who had helped him in the ICU, he was told that his lung function had increased to the point where it didn't look like he was going to need a lung transplant. 
he had shared that also that he had gone for an appointment. At the time that I had heard the testimony, the most recent appointment, the pulmonologist said to him something along the lines of, I can't tell you what to expect. Because the pulmonologist from his vantage point said, I don't know anyone like you in the country. So I don't know what to do with that. And then he said, I know what to do with that. He attributed it to the grace of God, unmerited, undeserved favor. We've seen God take home a lot of dearly loved saints. He knew God could take him home. He said, God could have taken me home, and God would have still loved me, would have still loved my wife. He would have still loved my children. He would have still been just. He said all of those things. But in his mind, he saw God using the prayers of his people. He said people he didn't even know him prayed for him. One woman came up to him, a woman he had never even met in his life, and said, I prayed harder for you than I've ever prayed for anybody in my life. Why do I share that with you? Because statistical analysis has its place. It does have its place. But it doesn't have the final say in the kingdom of God. God may choose to override the statistics. God may say, no, in according with the statistics, I'm bringing such a one home to me. And they are coming home. Or God may say, to statistics aside, doesn't matter. I'm going to bring such a one through and they will be an anomaly. So don't let statistics have the final say. They don't. God does. And whatever he does is just and good and perfect. So this is a good reminder for us, I think, in light of that first account concerning Jasho Beam. <laughs> and then comes Eleazar. Eleazar. He was one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle and the men of Israel had retreated. So here's the context here. Eleazar was a man who's fighting alongside of David. He's again in a battlefield. But the battlefield must have been so fierce that some people thought it was too fierce to stay there, and the men of Israel begin to retreat. You look in 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 13, we could see where this happened. It was a place that was apparently a field full of barley. It wouldn't be uncommon in those days for the Philistines to say, we are going to raid Israelite territory. They've got barley. We want it. And then the people of Israel would be scared and they would flee, but not Eleazar and not David. There they are, they hold their ground. And verse 10 says that he arose and he attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. Did you catch that? Until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. What does that teach you? This man had a grip. That's what it teaches me. You know, that's, that's part of what it teaches you. He didn't give up. What, what about this man is to be admired and emulated? Now, I'm not calling you to do this, right? I'm going to keep making these qualifiers in new covenant context, right? You're not called to do this. You're called to love your enemies. We'll get to the application for you and I. You wield a sword. It's not a literal sword. It's a spiritual sword. It's not a or physical sword. It's a spiritual sword. So you are called to wield that sword. We'll get to the application in a moment. But look at what you can learn from this man. He's there, and his hand likely cramped, and he's fighting Philistines alongside of David, trying to preserve the crop for the people in Israel, the men of Israel who had fleed from the camp. So there he is fighting, and maybe it's a mixture of his hand being in the position for so long that it cramps. Maybe, honestly, maybe it's just a mixture of the dynamics of the blood and the sweat that would just be mingled together, and his hand is just basically clutched to the sword that he doesn't stop holding it. He just keeps fighting the battle that was before him. While many retreated, he stayed and he becomes a kind of model here of dogged persistence. While many men were retreating, he did not, and he didn't quit. He stayed when others fled. So what can you and I learn from Eleazar? And I think it's rather simple. Persist. Persist. Now, know if you're a Christian, know that along the path of persistence, as you drive down that metaphoric path of persistence, there will be off-ramps, and there will be signs that say over and over again, what's the point? What's the use? And I want to encourage you to persist and don't get off of the off-ramps. To make this more specific, because you might wonder how I would apply this, I would apply this in this way. Jesus spoke a parable in Luke 18, verse 1, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Persist. Keep praying. Just because you haven't seen the answer to a given prayer today, maybe it's not God's will. Maybe you're not praying according to his will. But maybe he's working in you perseverance. Do not give up. Maybe in your own life, as you keep just serving the Lord, you know that you are called not to kill Philistines. But in the New Testament context, you're called to slay your own sin. 
right? Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 13, you are called by the Holy Spirit to kill not Philistines, not other people. You're called to love your enemies. You're called to kill your sin. So keep swinging the sword against your sin. What is the sin that is besetting you? Keep swinging the sword against it. Is it unforgiveness? Is it bitterness? Is it anger? Is it fornication? Is it lust? Is it lying? Is it a duplicitous lifestyle? What is it? Do not stop swinging the sword. Is it a tongue that says things that it shouldn't say? Is it a mind that thinks things that it shouldn't think? We all are assailed by our fallen flesh. We are all going to have some sin to battle at some point in our lives. You will not graduate from that until you are in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. But while you are here, persist. Keep swinging the sword of spiritual truth against the sin that you fight in your life. Persist. Persist in praying. I would encourage you, do not become apathetic and careless in your prayers. Do not become mindless or prayerless either. Persist. I would encourage you to persist like the woman who had an issue of blood. <clears throat> Remember, she had an issue of blood for 12 years. We find out in multiple gospel accounts. And she persisted for 12 years, right? She kept going to physicians trying to get better, but her best example of persistence was when she likely pushed through the crowd because the disciples said that the crowd was basically thronging, pushing upon Christ. But she pushed through the crowd. She touched the hem of his garment and by God's grace, she was healed. Persist. Galatians chapter 6 tells the church, do not grow weary in well-doing for if you faint not in due time, you will reap a harvest. Paraphrase of Galatians chapter 6 verse 9. Persist in doing good. Persist in faith, like those in Hebrews 11, who died having not received the promises, but having seen them afar off, Hebrews 11.13. So they kept persisting in faith. They knew that there was, a, there was a city whose builder and maker was God. They saw promises, but they saw them afar off, and they died not having received them in the land of the living, but they saw them afar off, and through their lives they persisted in faith. So again I say persist. Persist in proclaiming Christ like the apostles, even when you're faced with persecution, even when people mock you, persist. And as you persist, I would encourage you, yes, to behold an example like Eleazar, but I would tell you to make sure you set your eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who himself persisted. He endured the cross, according to Hebrews 12, despising the shame and you get to verse 3, we're told to consider him, think on him, lest you yourself become weary. Now, Eleazar's persistence was not the ultimate determiner of the outcome. You look at the end of verse 10, it said that the Lord, or Yahweh, brought about a great victory. We'll come back to that in verse 12. One other bit by way of encouragement, I want you to see this. Notice that there were other beneficiaries to his courage and persistence, right? You see that when we read, and the people returned after him, only to plunder, right? So part of the way that it happened in ancient warfare is that you would have access to whatever was on the battlefield. To the victor goes the spoils, that kind of dynamic. So David and Eliezer are holding the ground in the field of barley, but then, even though they are taking a stand, and even though they act in courage and persistence, yet so many others become beneficiaries of their courage and persistence. Simple question to you. Use your sanctified imagination. Who might be one or some of the blessed beneficiaries of your Christ-honoring persistence? Who might be some of the beneficiaries of your discipleship, of your praying, of your proclamation of the gospel, of your living like a light when it's hard, of you making hard choices and living like a Christian even when it's hard to do so? Who might be some of the beneficiaries of that? I think that's exciting to imagine. I got one other aside here. I also want to say as an aside, let me say, don't persist in sin. So this is a parenthetical pastoral note, okay? I see Eleazar here as an example of dogged persistence in a good way. Yet, yet, there could be many people who demonstrate dogged persistence in a bad way. They cleave to their given thing and they won't release it no, many, no matter how many pleas from the scripture come their way. I want to encourage you, don't persist in sin. Some people, no matter what you do, no matter what you say, they will persist in a duplicitous lifestyle. Having one mask for one group and another mask for another group. 
Don't persist in hypocrisy. Some people will grip unforgiveness as though it were a sword that was protecting them when it's actually killing them. Don't persist in unforgiveness and bitterness. Some will persist in the pursuit of money, even though to use language from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, they've already found themselves pierced through with many sorrows because of it. Don't persist in pursuing money as a result of the love of money. Don't persist in thinking that lukewarm is the tolerated norm in Christianity, right? That, yeah, lukewarm was bad for the Laodiceans, but lukewarm is normal for us. No, it is not. If you say, I'm lukewarm, then that's a big problem. So what do you do when you have that kind of big problem? You run to the cross. That's what you do. You don't try to fix your lukewarmness on your own. You run to Jesus and you tell him, I'm sorry for my lukewarmness. You thank him for blood that covers your sin. And then you expect him to work in you so that that lukewarmness will go. Remember, grace is the engine that drives this vehicle, as it were. Not law keeping, right? So when you hear lukewarm, don't think, oh, that's bad. I'm, I'm guilty. I have to now do some sort of works. Hold on. Don't go there first. Let grace be the engine that drives this vehicle. You run to Christ and you let Jesus change you from the inside out. So don't persist in those kind of things. Don't persist in thinking that friendship with the world is not enmity with God. Occasional stands for truth and occasional commendations for un, from unbelievers do not justify unrepentant disobedience to clear commands of Scripture. Let me tell you, as a watchman on the wall, the one, one that wants to make sure I have a clear, you know, clear hands before God, don't persist in these things. When there are clear commands of Scripture, come out from amongst them and be separate. No, of course, you're still supposed to be loving, but there's supposed to be a division. Now, you're saying, I'm going in a different direction now. I don't do the same things I used to do. I don't go to the same places I used to go. I don't say the same things I used to say. I've got a new calling. I love Christ. I want to serve people. I want to love people. I want to do these things. I can't just be among the world doing what the world does. There are so many things that have become normal in modern-day Christianity that aren't normal biblically. And people find ways to justify all kinds of behaviors, lukewarmness, living in the world, doing what the world does, bitterness, not forgiveness, all of those things. I want to encourage you as a watchman on the wall, don't persist in those things. Let the plumb line be the word of God. Let it be the, the tuning fork, as it were. And may the Holy Spirit tune you rightly, not to a standard that is less than the word of God, but by the grace of God increasingly to meet the standard that is in the word of God. Not perfectly, of course, but by God's grace in an increasing way. So give up ungodly persistence. That's a pastoral parenthetical note. That brings us to the third um, warrior who's mentioned, Shammah. Shammah. We're told that Shammah, the son of Agi, the Hararite, um, he was the one when the Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people had fled from the Philistines. He was the one, per verse 12, who stationed himself in the middle of the field, defended it, and killed the Philistines. So when you look at 1 Chronicles 11, this may be joined to the previous account of Eleazar. So a little bit of historical context. It may be that David and Eleazar are holding one plot of ground where the barley was. And that this man, Shammah, is holding the ground where the lentils are. Now, the big question that you're not to consider is, what made these lentils so good that this man was willing to give his life in defending them? No, that's not what's going on here. People needed to eat. What made these lentils special is that they were food, right? And the Philistines were either coming to raid the crops or destroy the crops. And if they got away with that, then Israelites would suffer hunger. Many would likely die. That's what made this special. Not that they were special lentils, but that they were food, and that's what made them special. So Shammah is here, and he stands his ground. Now, you don't know the details of what's going on here exactly. You imagine him in the middle of the field. This has all the elements of like a great cinematic moment, doesn't it? Field of lentils. Yeah, because that has all the makings of great cinema, doesn't it? Field of lentils. Shama standing there. Now, we don't know if he did this, but don't you imagine him maybe doing that? So you got this Philistine troop right there. And, and the picture here, at least as it's connoted in the scriptures, is that he kind of stands his ground alone. Now, maybe there's some other Israelites around, but we know that other Israelites had fled. The people fled from the Philistines, the end of verse 11. So he's a man here 
who seems as though the battle showed up at his doorstep. He wasn't looking for a fight. He wasn't looking to be a martyr or something like that. The battle showed up at his doorstep. A bunch of people take flight. He stands his ground to defend this field. That's who Shama was. You know, sometimes uh, you're not looking for a fight. You're, you're not looking to be provocative or controversial. With some of the messages that I've done in the last uh, two years, I wasn't doing it to be provocative or controversial. But there were things that needed to be addressed. And so in the different messages that um, I've done, I wanted to address them. And you'll have moments where you're not looking for a fight at all. You know, somebody says, you know, at the family function, you know, oh, Jesus is not the only way to heaven. You know, or somebody might even say something worse or whatever, and you're like, I got to stand. I have to stand. See, it's not that you're looking for a fight or looking for a debate, but sometimes it just comes to you. And Shama is an example. I think of a guy who's basically there in this field, and all of a sudden other people are taking flight, and he's like, at such a time as this, I have to take my stand. And he takes his stand, and by the grace of God, God works through him. A quick note, you can go through church history, you can go through biblical history, and you see moments like this. I'm sure it didn't feel easy for Paul when Barnabas and Peter, like Barnabas and Peter, when you go to Galatians 2, their behavior was misrepresenting the gospel. As though Gentiles were not worthy of table fellowship with Jews. As though Christ's blood hasn't united us so that we're all on the same level field, as it were. And he had to withstand Peter to the face. He wasn't looking for a, a debate with Peter, but it showed up and he had to stand. I think that's how Martin Luther probably felt. Here I stand, I could do no other. When he saw, when it was coming to his mind that doctrines in Rome just weren't jiving with the scripture, the authority structure in Rome didn't jive with the scripture, and that justification by faith alone was at the heart of the gospel, yet it wasn't proclaimed in Rome. He wasn't looking for a fight, it seems, and to, early on, he was looking for a debate. He wanted to debate the 95 Thesis. He wanted to debate indulgences. But the fight that showed up at his doorstep was a big one, and he had to stand. And I want to encourage you that there will be times when you have to stand for what is right, and you might be the only one. You might be the only one in a group at dinner, and you've got to stand. Somebody says something about Christianity, and you're like, that's not true. I've got to stand. You might be in a grammar school classroom or a high school classroom, or a college classroom, and remarks are made, whether about the scriptures, whether about the God of the Bible, and you're like, no, this may lead to a bad grade. I'm the one here. I have to stand. I have to speak up here. Who knows where it could be? It could be anywhere. It could be in your home. It could be in your workplace. It could be at a family function. And if you are the only one, and even if you're not the only one, because Shama might have had Eleazar and David not too far away from him, I want to encourage you to stand. Quick note here, and I think this is important. Uh, yes, because some of you might be thinking this, and if you're thinking this, I, I, want, I want to say it because I think it helps for clarity. Yes, fidelity, faithfulness to God does not only demonstrate itself in public stands. A great, I think a great example of this would be in 1 Kings. You see Elijah. Elijah was somebody who was called to take a public stand big time, right? He's standing against the 450 prophets of Baal. He's standing against an evil king, Ahab, a bloodthirsty queen, Jezebel, a nation that was in rebellion. The nation of Israel had transgressed God's covenant, torn down his altars, and he essentially had to stand alone, at least so he thought. But he had to stand. But then there's an example of quiet faithfulness as well. Somebody who stood, but it was in a beneath-the-radar sort of way. Remember Obadiah? 1 Kings chapter 18. He was that man who served in Ahab's house, yet he knew Jezebel was massacring the prophets, so what did he do? He took a hundred prophets, he hid them in a cave, and he fed them with bread and water. So in the Christian life, there'll be dynamics of quiet faithfulness, but then there are times when the issue is brought before you, the moment presents itself right to you, and you have to take a stand. And by God's grace, may you have such courage to do so when a public stand in some context is necessary and right. One other thing I want to note, um, there is a common thread in these three narratives here of people who stood their ground, people who acted in courage. But there's also a common thread, and we see it at the end of verse 10 and the end of verse 12, and what is that? 
Twice we're told that Yahweh provided the victory. Yahweh provided the victory. Yes, God honoring courage is to be honored, but it's not for the purpose of puffing up. Yahweh is the one who brings about the victory. Whenever there's any success that God brings about, it's his gracious gift to you and to others. So what are those statements meant to do? Statements in the end of verse 10 and verse 12 that tell us that Yahweh brought about the victory. I think they're meant to snuff out pride. Snuff out pride. So that you don't glory in your courage or glory in your sword wielding or you glory in your taking a stand. No, 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 no. If there's any good that is worked out through you, ultimately all the glory goes to God. By the grace of God, you are what you are, to borrow language from Paul in verse 15, but applying it in a second person way. Now that brings us to this next account. Now my comments on this, I just want to kind of tell this story, and I want, to, I want you to see this. I think this will be invigorating and exciting. Uh, verses 13 through 17. Then three of the thirty chief men went down at harvest time and came to David at the cave of Adullam. And the troop of the Philistines encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David said with longing, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of the water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but he poured it out to the Lord or to Yahweh. And he said, Far be it from me, O Lord or O Yahweh, that I should do this. Is this not the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things were done by the three mighty men. So the context is relatively simple to understand. This was either during David's days of being in flight from Saul, 1 Samuel 22, when he was at the cave of Adullam, or it could be during the early part of his reign. In either case, you'll get 2 Samuel 5.17. In either case, it seemed like the Philistines were everywhere at this time. They're just like an infestation in the land, and they seem to be showing up everywhere. Whatever the exact chronology was, these are the details, essentially. In David's hometown of Bethlehem, the Philistines are there. They essentially have it occupied, or they have a post there. But in the Valley of Rephaim, on the way to David's hometown, the Philistines have a post there. So again, it's like the Philistines are everywhere. And David is in this stronghold. He's in this cave that is proven to be a kind of, a kind of fortress of sorts that he's used in times past or in this moment. And while he's there, he has a moment of longing. He just says, oh, that someone would give me a drink of the water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. Now, this wasn't a command. This would be like you saying, like, oh, that someone would just get me a slice of pizza from Spumoni Gardens. That's what it would be. It's, it's like something like that. It'd be like if, if I said, oh, if I just had the filet mignon topped with crab meat from the Skull Creek Boathouse in Hilton Head, South Carolina. I wouldn't expect anyone to go there. If you want to go there, <laughs> and you can manage to preserve it and bring it back, don't let me stop you if you feel so led to do so. But that's what it was. Like, I'm not expecting somebody to go, like, he, his wish <laughs> is now my prerogative. But yet, there were three men who heard David say this. That's a longing. It's kind of just that moment when the expression of your heart comes out, when longing meets recollection and it results in expression. That's all this was. These men hear it, and David's longing became their mission. And in a rather simple way, the text tells him in verse 16, the mighty men broke through the camp of Philistines. So there were three of them. However many Philistines there was, it just wasn't a problem. They broke through the camp. And they didn't like even go around in some sort of stealthy way. That would have been impressive. But it appears that when they went through the valley of Rephaim, and then they went through whatever Philistines were in Bethlehem, and they make their way to the well. By the way, that was like a 12-mile trip, 24 miles you know, round trip. Kind of a big deal, I think. So they go, and they take the water, and they bring it back to David. And you might be shocked when you see this happen, because you might not understand what's going on. I understand. I think in my early days of reading the scriptures, I was kind of disappointed with what David did. Because the men go and they get the water. David gets the water, and he pours it out before the Lord. And that's how I kind of read it early on in my Christian life. Really? These men just went and got you water, and then you just pour out the water? No, 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 no. David is doing something very right here. Although it could look like he's being wasteful. 
But worship is never wasteful. When I preached through the Gospel of Luke, there was a message I had preached called, What Made Jesus Marvel? It was based upon um, text in Luke 7. And it was the faith of a Roman centurion. You could identify or classify or call this portion, verses 13 through 17, what made David marvel. David's act here, his, his response to what they did, was an act of astonishment. He saw the self-sacrificial act of these men, and he basically says, it was like they brought me back their own blood. So think about what David was doing with this. He takes the water, and he's essentially saying, I'm not worthy of this. But he knows the one who is worthy of it. So he pours it out before who? Before the Lord. David acting in humility. This was a sacrifice. They put their lives on their line. It's like they came and they just brought back their own blood. I'm not worthy of this. So David, who is the king, realizes there's a king that's much greater and over him. And he acts in humility. And for that, we are very thankful to be instructed by such humility in the text of Scripture. That's what he was doing. It wasn't a waste. Rather, it was worship. Worship. I don't deserve this. But Yahweh does. Sometimes I think you serve in the local church long enough, whether you're in a pulpit or in the pews, and you are the recipient of acts of kindness that you just say, I do not deserve this. God is so gracious. And what do you do? As a recipient of those acts of kindness, you essentially just take them, as it were, and you kind of pour it out before the Lord, and you say, you are worthy of praise because you are working through your people, and I don't deserve this, but you are worthy of every sacrifice of worship, of praise. These three men instruct us, don't they? I would put it a different way. I'd say I think these three men challenge us. If they were willing to do this for their king, whether he was the king to be anointed and to be crowned, or whether he had already been crowned, newly crowned, if they do this for David, fallen David, yet their king or king to be, how might they challenge us as to how we ought to live for our king, the Lord Jesus Christ? Look what they were willing to do. It just forces me to ask the question, what am I willing to do? What are we willing to do in obedient sacrifice to our king? But I want to go one more place before I close. I want to take it one step further. I want us to see this little narrative here through New Testament and New Covenant lenses. We couldn't secure a drink of the water of life. So our king left his throne in heaven. Our king is the one who went out, and he didn't simply risk his life. He laid down his life so that we, by his grace, might drink freely of the water of life. Because our king left, not a cave of Adullam, but our king left the glories of heaven, took on human flesh, not, not laying aside his deity, but adding to his deity humanity. Our Savior is the one who came and he laid down his life. So I could say to you, by the grace of God, quoting Revelation twenty two seventeen, let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. And the only reason that you could come and drink of the water of life is because Jesus Christ came and died. The one who was upon the cross and said, I thirst, is the one who died bearing the wrath that you and I deserve so that you might drink and never thirst again, as it were. You may drink freely because Jesus died sacrificially. The king didn't simply leave the cave. The king left the glories of heaven and he went to a cross. And I want you to hear this. I want you to see the willingness of God to forgive such a one as you. Recall what Jesus told the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4. He said, if you knew the gift of God and who is asking you for a drink, because remember Jesus asked her for a drink of water, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Does that not speak of the readiness of Christ to forgive sinners? If you knew the gift of God, and I can apply it to you, if you know the gift of God, that God sent His Son and placed upon Him the iniquity of all who would believe upon Him, if you knew the gift of God and you knew who was speaking to you through the text of Scripture, you would ask Him. 
and he'd give you the water of life. Do you want eternal life? Do you want forgiveness of sins? Ask, and it shall be given. Confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Acknowledge that you're a sinner before Almighty God and that your righteousness cannot secure you a place in the kingdom. Your well is dry. Or to mix metaphors, your well is full of sin. <laughs> and the only way that you could drink freely from the water of life is because by the grace of God, you've come to see that the Son of God died on the cross so that a fountain of cleansing might be forever opened so that you might come to him and have newness of life forevermore. Thanks be to God. That fountain that's open, you're washed and you are forever cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. So if you see the gift of God today in the gospel, that one greater than David died so that you might be forgiven, I close with saying, acknowledge your sin, repent of it, turn to God, believe that Jesus is the Lord and Savior, receive the living water that he gives, and may today mark the day of the beginning of your new life as you confess him as Lord and Savior before men, and as you follow him by his grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Savior. Oh, we thank you that we could come and drink freely of living water, both now and forever, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you have shown us that greatest of all gifts, Lord, the offering of your Son on the cross for sinners, the one much greater than David, great David's greater son, who left the glories of heaven, humbled himself to be conceived in the womb of a virgin, and then humbled himself, took the form of a servant, and humbled himself to the point of death, even death on the cross. Lord, perhaps this day there will be those who will come to that place of saying, I believe that he is the promised son of David, the promised Messiah, the one through whom forgiveness would come, and the only one through whom forgiveness can come. Father, for those who have come to that place, I pray that we might be freshly instructed by all that is before us in this text, Lord. May you work these graces that we've considered in us, whether it be persistence or courage, Lord, whether it be, Heavenly Father, humility, or growing in the grace of worshiping you. May you continue to work in us that which is pleasing in your sight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your instruction. Thank you for the life of David and the narrative in 2 Samuel and all we could learn from it, Lord. And we thank you for great David's greater son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the gift of God that he is to all who would receive him as Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.